<laughs> Welcome everyone to Hunarts Live. Uh, this is our monthly Conscious Collaboration Circle event. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Conscious Collaboration Circle, we started this uh, monthly spotlight because we just became convinced that we we need to build a different ecosystem for business that the existing market driven uh, ecosystem uh, just produces uh, more and more for the one percent and makes it more and more difficult for small businesses uh, who are making a difference in the world and Certainly the pandemic has made it really obvious that those uh, little guys are struggling when, when they're forced to compete with the big guys like Amazon or Walmart or uh, some of the other large e-commerce and other traditional commerce businesses that are all focused on growth. So we decided at Hoonarts that uh, one thing we could do was spotlight other small businesses and nonprofit organizations that are making a difference every day in the world, but still struggling to get heard. Uh, and what we've seen over the last few years is that sometimes the little guys are actually being a lot more efficient and effective in carrying out their mission but because they can't compete uh, with resources, with the big guys, they don't get the attention, they don't get the funding, they don't get the audience. So we said, well, what can Hoonarts do? And we decided we can just simply share our audience with other organizations who are dedicated to making a difference. So that's a little of the history uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Ricky Quintana. I'm the founder and executive director of Hunarts Fair Trade. Uh, and with me today, I have Wen King, the founder of Rover and Kin, another fair trade company that works with small artisan groups in Nepal and India. And you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. And we also have our chief collaborator, Denise Bucci, uh, Denise is joining us from Asheville, North Carolina, when you're in the Bay Area, right? Exactly. And uh, I wanted to uh, call Denise out. Uh, this may well be her last appearance on Hoonarts Live. Uh, Denise has been a part of Hoonarts in one way or another from the day, literally the day it was founded. She attended the farewell party with a delegation of young professionals from Tajikistan when I stood up and said, I'll do it. I'll build a market for Central Asian handicrafts. And she's had a much more active role over the last year. And she's now going to be transitioning into a full-time position with another organization and I won't be able to have her do quite as much. Uh, she assures me that she'll be there uh, from time to time, but as a regular member of the of this team, uh, I'm going to have to manage the tech by myself. Uh, those of you who tuned in last time uh, may have had the experience of watching me uh, describe photos that you couldn't see on Facebook. And that was because I forgot to push share screen. So I'm going to have to develop a checklist in giant letters so that I don't forget any of the steps. But I, I wanted to especially thank you, Denise, for being part of the team and for your immense uh, contribution to building Hoonarts, uh, bringing us to where we are today and just your shared vision, the opportunity to just talk with somebody else who, who sees a different vision of what's possible in the world has 
made my job so much easier and helped me get up in the morning. So I want you to know how much your contribution is appreciated both in terms of the business and for me personally. Gosh, Ricky, <laughs> make us all emotional at the very <laughs> If you've watched these before, you know that I, I get teary eyed. Uh, I tend to get emotional, but I wanted to officially and publicly acknowledge you. Thank so, you so much, Ricky. Uh, I appreciate it. Now, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Wen King, who is the founder of Rover and Kin. Uh, if you are attending, you've got a, a long bio, so I don't think I will repeat that. You can read it in the uh, in the text of the, the posts or your registration. Uh, so I will just welcome Wen and ask you to begin with your, stir, your story. How did you end up founding a fair trade company working with artisans in India and Nepal? <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, oh, let's see, you spotlighted me. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, my name is Wen. I'm really happy to be with all of you guys today and to you know share a little bit about my story. Um, so if I were to talk about how this all got started, I would have to rewind a bit, um, all the way back to, I guess, probably my 20s um, when I moved to India. Um, so after college, I, you know, wanted to do something with my life that wasn't a entry level office job that I didn't like. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to experience things as any like 20, 21 year old would. Um, so I traveled a lot. I backpacked a lot. Um, and I decided that when I finished school, I would move to India. Um, so I bought a one-way ticket um, and I was volunteering full-time um, in the Tibetan exile community of Dalamsala, Northern India. Um, it's home of the Tibetan exile community where the Dalai Lama lives. There's lots of nonprofits, um, lots of NGOs. So I was teaching English there for, gosh, I don't even know how long. Um, but, you know, that was such a great, it was such a great time in my life. I was volunteering. I was helping um, another nonprofit set up a, a little shop. Um, and then after a while, I decided to start um, my own thing. And it was a community cafe um, where we had events, we had classes. Um, but I wanted to create like a kind of an informal um setting for for dialogue for discourse and for screenings and things like that so we had classes music classes language classes um and then in the cafe there was a corner where um we had a shelf of uh local handmade crafts there was pottery there was um glass blown jewelry um and some other fair trade and handmade stuff and I was really drawn to that part. Um, I loved going to the workshops to visit the artisans and to learn about the process. And so long story short, like fast forward eight years, because I had really, <laughs> you know, it was it was a great, it was a great way to spend my my 20s. Um, I lived there for yeah, almost a decade. Um, and then got married. Um, and when my husband and I decided to move to the US, I guess that would be like six, six or seven years ago. Um, like all there was, all we thought about was like, oh, of course we're gonna start our own fair trade business. Like it wasn't like we weren't gonna go and get jobs. Like <laughs> you just do what you know. Um, but yeah, during that time, we did a lot of traveling. We went to a lot of different workshops um, and we visited all sorts of different craft producers um, and really got to spend time learning about the process. Like I would, you know, learn how to do block printing and saw like how they carve each block out by hand onto teak wood 
and then how they stamp each pattern, um, you know, on top of each other and then do the resist and then do the bat dyeing and just like all of the processes. Um, and and then, yeah, we moved to the U.S. We started our fair trade shop, Cora, in Berkeley, California. Um, and after after a while, gosh, it was 2018, um, I decided to um, establish like a separate brand um, called Rover and Kin that kind of grew to be its own, own independent brand. And we sell to a couple hundred stores across the U.S. Um, because that was that was kind of my approach of creating more impact through the work that I do because when you sell at one brick and mortar shop, there's only a certain you know a certain quantity of of earrings of textiles that you can that you can sell and so in, in order to scale, um, I was thinking, okay, let me let me create Rover and Kin and have just a separate line of you know, fair trade, sustainable products with a more modern kind of aesthetic. Um, so yeah, we started in 2018 and it's been going ever since. The pandemic was a bit of a hiccup. <laughs> it was uh, been a hard year as, you know, I'm sure you've yes. experienced too, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a pretty wild ride. <laughs> um, uh, to say the least. How did you settle on the name Rover and Kin? Oh, <laughs> you know, it is so hard to come up with a name now because either everything is, everything is taken domain wise, you know? So you have to think like, okay, what can I create that is easily searchable on Google? But anyways, I just thought, you know, Rover is, is me, <laughs> I'm the, the traveler and um, some of our artisan partners we've been working with for a long time, um, like, you know, for the past seven years. And, you know, after a while, they become like family, as I'm sure you know. Absolutely. And so it's kind of like, you know, like, we're all travelers in this world. And at the end of the day, we are just all one kin. We're all one big human family, you know, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Your story about choosing a name, I had the same challenge uh, when I started Hunarts. And I can remember spending several days texting back and forth. I wanted something that had a positive meaning mm -hmm. in both the Tajik language and English that was simple and that people could pronounce. And as you said, for which I could get the domain name. Yeah. And uh, I, I was working by text with uh, Bakhradin, who is one of our main coordinators in Tajikistan and one of the delegates who visited uh, New Mexico and was part of the inspiration for the company. And one of his colleagues, who I now know well, at the time he was the, ex the executive director of the Union of Craftsmen of Tajikistan, and we had a professional uh, interpreter translator. And we'd say, well, what about this? Or how do you say that? Oh, that's too long. Americans couldn't pronounce that. Uh, so we went round and round. We'd find something, it would look great. And the domain name was not available. Yeah. So our name uh, is the fusion of the Tajik word Hunar, which means mm -hmm. craft, Oh, okay. And the English word arts. Yeah, I like it. It's very easy to remember, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, and it, I, I don't get confused with anybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, that's one of those little behind the scenes things that uh, entrepreneur, people who are not entrepreneurs uh, don't realize how much time and energy can go into just yeah. finding a company name. Yep. The name, the logo. Yeah, all of it. All of it. <laughs> um, so can you tell us a little bit more about exactly what kinds of products you produce, uh, the artisan groups you work with and where they come from and how mm -hmm. you chose those um, yeah. for your for your 
uh, business? Mm -hmm. Um, so right now we are primarily a jewelry brand. So we have a collection of like, we have these wood earrings that you can see. Oh, I like kind of like really simple kind of basic or minimalist style, um, earrings mostly. Um, and we work with, uh, fair trade partners in India and we've just added on two new partners, um, in, in India and Nepal, but one of the main, I mean, the main requirement for us to start collaborating with an artisan partner is that um, they have to be, you know, a fair trade organization. And right now, everyone we work with is a member of the World Fair Trade Organization, so it's fair trade guaranteed. So they all go through um, quite a rigorous system of auditing um, and different processes to continue to be a member of the World Fair Trade Organization. So that means, you know, um, everything is transparent um, from the salaries to, you know, their commitments to sustainability. So, for example, I've been working with one of our main partners in India, in Delhi, um, is to completely eliminate the use of plastic in any of our packaging. And so our next shipments coming the end of this month Oh gosh, it's the 22nd. So we are at the end of the month. <laughs> it's, everything is super late this year. Um, so we'll be getting our first shipments with plastic free packaging. And so as their commitment to being, you know, a WFTO World Fair Trade Organization member, like they have their commitment to sustainability and we have our commitment to sustainability. So it's easier for us to, you know, together work to find solutions, like whether it's, you know, poly bags or bags made from cornstarch or for, for our jewelry packaging, we're going to be using um, this kind of vellum um, clear. It's not a, it's not plastic. It's like a, a type of paper that you can kind of see through um, mm -hmm. and then using that instead of plastic. Um, and then like, instead of using foam backers, um, we'll be using cardboard. And so having these really strong relationships with partners whose values align with yours is really, really important. Um, and so the partners we work with are not only, you know, dedicated to fair trade and fair practices, but also they're kind of, we're, we're on the same boat. And the funny thing, not funny thing, the, the great thing about working with, um, you know, all these organizations, many of whom are nonprofits, um, is that they all know each other and they all work with each other. And so um, our producer in Mumbai is doing all of our printing and then he can send the tags to our producer in, in, in Delhi because they've all met each other at the fair trade conferences, you know, mm -hmm. in India and Europe. And so we're kind of, we're on the same page in terms of what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is to create sustainable livelihoods for the people that we work with and the people that we work with um, are from marginalized communities. So that means like one of our groups that makes our clay jewelry, um, they're in a urban resettlement area of New Delhi that is kind of like an unincorporated part. Um, and the our craft partners have set up a school um, that provides after school tutoring and also a center that takes care of the elderly as well as a community clinic. And so when you think about bringing jobs, like good paying jobs and sustainable jobs that respects people and prioritize the people on the planet, um, it affects the whole community. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just, it's great that there is a, you know, a sustainable income, but more holistically, you know, I love the partners that we work with because Employment, sustainable employment is definitely one layer and it's probably the most important. But um, when we talk about, you know, capacity building, that also includes um, access to health, um, having those free, having uh, health insurance included and having access to those community clinics, mm -hmm. um, having their kids being able to seek help with their schooling after school um and you know other micro lending um and community initiatives that can really you know all together is more of a holistic approach to sustainable developments 
And of course, employment is is the main one, um, it's, and it's the one that we focus on. Um, and so that's just one group. There's, you know, I'm just uh, adding all of this information to our website actually um, to talk about, um, you know, the specific groups of people that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yeah, go ahead. Uh, how many artisans approximately all together um, are involved in the groups that you work with? It's um, it's hard to say because these artisans they don't only produce for me. It's actually more beneficial for these artisan groups to produce for many different brands because mm -hmm. say if anything happens to me, it's it's less risk for them to diversify kind of um their their base. Um, and so I mean it's definitely it's over over five hundred altogether. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, they definitely, they produce for other, other fair trade, um, brands that I'm also very familiar with and work together on some capacity. And so like some of, some of kind of my acquaintances, I guess, fair trade friends, um, we, we work with the same people, mm -hmm. um, and you know, they have their style and we have our style. Um, and yeah, it's a part of this this collaboration that I just think is so cool that um, it is not about the competition. Like the more, the bigger that all of our businesses get, um, that means the more jobs are provided. Um, and it's great that we can kind of, you know, all swap notes in a sense, mm -hmm. you know, how to get there. The uh... The impact of working with with artisans as fair trade businesses is uh, sometimes it can be measured easily in in things like the the larger initiatives that you talked about. Um, I, I was talking not too long ago with one of our artisans in Tajikistan, and she was telling the individual story of. Uh, one of the artisans that she works with, who uh, is uh, has a disability, has no access to a, a regular job, and was doing just one little task, uh, built making beaded tassels. And over the course of the the several years that she's been working with our artisan group, uh, she's. Uh, expanded her her textile her artistry uh, and she's now become a leader when she started she didn't want to learn anything new she did she just wanted to do tassels and now she has become a both a an artisan leader uh, and has developed new designs and reinvigorated some weaving, created new weaving techniques using uh, carpet weaving techniques, but using a thinner uh, thread, a cotton embroidery thread, with the weaving then being incorporated into uh, purses and bags. Uh, but uh, Munina went on to, to describe the uh, the social impact she's had in her community. Uh, she was the first one to uh, enclose her bathroom and uh, expand the the covered area for her home. And now other people in the community are doing following her lead so her entire community even though they're not working with um, the artisans directly that that leadership and a little bit more cash flowing into the economy has just had amazing ripple effects and that's one of the things that's most inspiring to me about working in the fair trade community yeah, definitely. I mean, um, every time I go back and and visit the artisans, you know, you know, they share similar stories, and and it's always um, I don't know. I guess these days I I try to to find a balance of like what like the impacts that I I want to see um, and 
sharing stories that um that don't portray like I, I want to see our partners as mm, I'm not really sure where I'm going with this as grab that thought <laughs> well I, I'm guessing uh, tell me if I'm wrong but I yeah. think uh where you were going was that your partners are partners and that you are focused on allowing them to grow with dignity and not be victims or yeah, i just you know even though of course we have consents with all of the stories that we used to share um i'm not sure if they want to be portrayed in that light and that's something that i've become more conscious about um mm -hmm. in terms of would would i want somebody to share those stories about me or you know and so it's um it's come up this topic has come up in the fair trade community right. quite a lot and i'm really thankful for that because you know as as i started looking into it i felt like maybe you know i was doing some of these things or portraying some of these things um so i think it's a really important topic to talk about um and i'm still struggling with that all the time like how do we talk about what we do um but in a way that is representative of the actual situation without trying to glorify what I do because right. what I want to do is I want to make products responsibly and it's equally I'm equally benefiting as the people I work with you know mm -hmm. the whole thing with fair trade is that yes we challenge the purpose of business but it's it's a relationship based on transparency so that everyone um, is able to maintain a dignified livelihood, including myself. And mm -hmm. so like I'm helping myself and they're helping themselves and we're all helping ourselves, but it's just, it's a, it's a more transparent and responsible way to do so that honors the people that are all involved as well right. as the planet. And so I'm just, we've done a lot of refining with language and how to present that because you know, no one wants to go in with a savior mentality right. of saving people. No, I'm saving myself too. Like we're, we're all, mm -hmm. we're all in it together, but, um, but it's been a struggle to, you know, be an anti-racist activist and know how to navigate the language um, that is actually representative of what is happening so mm -hmm. it's been a real struggle for me personally and i know for many other fair trade brands I, it well. has and i i've always said i never wanted to sell what i referred to as pity products exactly exactly uh but communicating your impact and the stories in a way that acknowledges the challenges that our artisans face without yeah. denigrating their dignity and their as human beings and the the artistry and the culture and the stories that they bring to the table yeah. so that people in the west can uh, understand and appreciate um, the the partnerships the common humanity and the beautiful diversity yeah. Of, of the yeah. people that we are able to work with. Exactly. So it, it's, um, and that that's a, a great uh, segue to my next question. And that is, what have you found to be your biggest challenges over time? Oh my time? God, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It's like from day one. <laughs> um, how about every single day? No. <laughs> The biggest challenge. I mean, most recently, I've really struggled with what we were just talking about. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to get away from what is at the heart of what I do and what's like why I do what I do, which is creating beautiful products, um, but doing it, doing it in a way so that it supports a sustainable development. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of the many approaches that supports sustainable developments. And I wouldn't be doing this, I wouldn't be doing what I do every day if it wasn't for that aspect. Like right. if I was getting accessories, you know, mass made at 
you know, a place that I wasn't sure how people were being treated and I know wasn't beneficial to, you know, the people on the planet, I, I wouldn't, there wouldn't be this business today. Um, but yeah, one of the challenges, I guess, hmm, there's so many to pick from, um, <laughs> from most recently I've been trying to put together a better workflow, um, and sticking to deadlines because when you're a really small business, especially this past year during a pandemic, when mm -hmm. your producer groups are shut down, um, how do you stick to, how do you stick to a timeline and get your products released, um, on time and creating workflow processes, um, for you and your team so that you can stay on top of your tasks. I mean, this is like kind of the boring nitty gritty stuff of, I guess, of building a business mm -hmm. in a way that is, um, efficient because time is so hard to come, come by. <laughs> like right. every day your to-do list is so long and I'm always over, I always add too many things to my list. I'm like, oh, if I get all of these done today, I can be done by four o'clock. But that happens never. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, discovered, you know experience? I've discovered over the years that I have a definite tendency to overestimate what I can accomplish yep. in a set period of time, overestimate what I can reasonably do, and then beat myself up over not getting it done fast enough. Yep. Yep. Uh, like the other day I was like, oh, look, all of these, uh, these transactions do not import onto the bookkeeping app. And then some of these like double listed. So let me just get on tech support and figure this out. And then like two hours later, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, wow. uh, that, that, uh, the tech side has been a, has always been a challenge for Hunarts. And I, I started at a time when I barely knew how to use word and post on Facebook. And, uh, like just before we started this, I I've hired a remote virtual assistant and I needed oh. to give her access to Facebook yeah. business suite so yeah. that she can schedule uh, posts and stories in advance on Facebook and Instagram. And the amount of time it f took to find the right page mm -hmm. and the order in which I had to do it <laughs> so yeah. that I could add her as a, as a authorized uh, team member was ridiculous. <laughs> yep. And, I hear you. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of that. And I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to schedule that in. Like I'm trying to schedule Fridays to be a day where I do all the stuff that I didn't get to do Monday to Thursday, <laughs> you know, like it's like a fill in day. Right. And you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a process for, for small business entrepreneurs. Um, but it's, it's about, enjoying like celebrating the small wins and just enjoying the process which is something that i've learned this past year um mm -hmm. cuz life is full of hiccups and unforeseen whatevers you know and this past year has shown us that right all of us that anything that you plan can just be completely thrown off the track um but yeah, human beings are incredibly res resilient. We're mm -hmm. incredibly resilient, all of us. And so, yeah, it's been. <laughs> yeah, working with my own mindset has been one of my biggest challenges. Uh, moving into entrepreneurship very late in my life. I spent 31 years as a practicing lawyer and avoiding anything that looked like entrepreneurship. Uh, so I came in thinking, well, I don't need to worry about mindset because I, mm -hmm. I know how to work hard. I know how to learn. Yeah. Um, I have a positive work ethic. What more do you need? 
<laughs> well, I thought it was really interesting earlier when you said that being an entrepreneur is way harder than being a lawyer. <laughs> I would have not thought that. <laughs> the, um, in my case, uh, one of the, the biggest challenges of being an entrepreneur is you have to be willing to move in uncertainty and take risks. Yes, yes. And yeah. my entire life up till I retired as a lawyer was about limiting risk, avoiding risk, mm -hmm. creating certainty. Yeah. And getting comfortable in the world of risk and uncertainty. And yeah. it, in my case, I'm the only one in the U.S. trying to do what I'm what I'm doing with the Hunard's artisans. So there's no other expert to tell me how to do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it took me a few years to build the the confidence to trust that I could actually be the the driver in the car instead of right. relying on an expert to tell me what I should do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like you're literally laying new ground and that's that's exhausting, you know, like it's rewarding because you can see the progress, but still it's, you know, like just even visually thinking about <laughs> setting new pavement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Going yeah. your own path. Yeah, definitely. There is. Yeah, you're you're blazing your own trail and. And there's no, there's no right answer in a lot of situations. <laughs> you just got to go with your gut. Yes. Uh, learning to trust myself has been a, has been a very, uh, oh, yeah. a, a very interesting experience. I, I've definitely struggled with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think any entrepreneur does. Um, and I, I do think it, it's more challenging for women because social expectations are uh, different, yeah. even in the even in twenty twenty one, as we saw during the pandemic, <laughs> social expectations of women oh. uh, are different. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the pandemic, you talked a little bit about how it's impacted your your work and your business. Um, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, experience of the last year and a half? Well, it was just last, last spring. It was just, I thought, you know, things were, things were shitty here. Yeah. But then when I talked to our partners in India, it was like, okay, they're, <laughs> what they're going through is a lot worse than what we're facing, um, mm -hmm. especially with a lot of the underserved communities that we work with. And so immediately it was like, I wasn't even thinking about, oh, production has stopped. It was like, God, what, what can we do to help? Um, do and they have food? You know, being, being, you know, a fair trade organization that they are, they, yeah, it wasn't a second thought about stopping production, but it was more like, okay, how do we, how do we help all of our, our all of our employees and people we work with in these communities? And so, we started um, a GoFundMe and started fundraising for food ration kits, um, like dry food rations, which was like doll and pulses, um, and also medical kits, which is like face masks and thermometers and things like that. Um, and so we've been fundraising the past year, and they were able to distribute. Um, gosh, I don't even remember the number by now. Last time it was like around seven hundred food kits. Um, but like thousands of hot meals and medical kits um, and about $13,000. Um, and then we also contributed um, another 3000 And so it was just a matter of like, it's like triage, you know, like this is what's needed most urgently at that time. Um, so like we scrapped together, like we tried to, we had some, <laughs> I mean, our business definitely suffered, but in the U.S. we have a safety net, right. you know, like we got a lot of support as a small business, um, but in many parts of the world, there is no safety net. Like, first of all, many people work in, in the formal sector, informal sector, and 
they don't have unemployment. They don't have small business grants. Like that support is not there. They don't have um, PPP loans or idle loans. PPP or loans. And like, it was just learning that was really devastating. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of a empathic person and it wasn't helping the situation, but I just like was gutted when I heard about, you know, when they talk to you about, first of all, like losing family members yes. and then not having oxygen and then just, you know, people live in much tighter quarters. Um, just the sense of helplessness of like, well, it's not fair. First of all, obviously none of it is fair, but just like, I can't do anything to help, you know, and there is no end in sight. And it's like, emotionally, it was just even hard for me to listen. <laughs> it sounds really bad to say it was hard for me to listen to it when they're actually the ones experiencing it. But just, um, yeah, I just felt like I... But it's that, that sense of helplessness. That so. sense of powerlessness. I've experienced the same thing with our Hunarts artisan groups, which are much, much smaller. But even now, uh, the they, Central Asia is experiencing a new surge. So even though our main artisan managers have already lost members, family yeah. members and neighbors to COVID, well, there's a new round. Uh, yeah. One of our artisan managers lost the, the third close family member just last week. Uh, the entire family is sick. There are no vaccines. So uh, it reminds me every day of uh, the things we have to be grateful for living in the West and more committed than ever to building a different ecosystem yeah. so that ultimately everyone can support each other and experience yeah. that, um, that sense of community and unity. Exactly. Yeah, um, when you talk about, you know, building this ecosystem is, it's so important because during the pandemic, I really saw that um, our artists and partners, it's, if it was like a, a traditional business, if their employees and their artisans were struggling, it's kind of like, well, that's not my business. Do you know what I mean? Not um, my problem. <laughs> it's a, a very different approach. Whereas like I could see during the pandemic that, the people we worked with were really taken care of. And, you know, the rooms where they used to sit and be jewelry and, you know, do all of the, all of the work and packaging and everything, they turned into, they were like filled with grains and pulses and uh, PPE and like masks. And like, it was a distribution center and there's a soup kitchen. And it just like, you adapt to the needs of your community you're not yeah. adapting to the needs of your bottom line, right. you know? So when you prioritize people, when you work with people that prioritize people, it changes everything. It is a totally different ecosystem. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. that's what get, keeps me getting up in the morning every day uh, is knowing that it is having that kind of, of bridge building and ecosystem building yeah. impact, even if it doesn't immediately translate to the financial bottom line, building yeah. those bridges and building those relationships. And uh, it's a long, it's a long, it's a long haul, you know, like sustainable mm -hmm. development doesn't happen overnight. Um, and economic vitality doesn't nurture itself in the short term. It's, right. it's a long term thing. And I hope that like everyone who does business can see that there's so much opportunity um, with every transaction you choose to take, like everything you buy affects somebody somewhere across the world. And if you just look a little bit deeper, if you look a little bit harder, you can see that, well, this thing has the power to positively, positively affect somebody else, um, whether it's locally or internationally. Mm -hmm. um just not mindlessly consuming 
which is very easy to do. It's very easy to mindlessly consume. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, we all have a lot of a lot more power as consumers than we might imagine. I think if you just you know like collectively, <laughs> it's a lot of purchasing power. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, if you could give advice to another small social impact business or organization, what would be one piece, one tip or one piece of advice uh, that you would give someone starting out? Um, I would say like gather all of those expectations, all those things that you think is going to happen and like just throw them away <laughs> like put them all in a basket write them down and just like it's like everything is turned upside down and then twisted around and nothing is really what you ever expect it to be so if you don't learn how to enjoy the journey it's gonna be a tough time <laughs> absolutely uh, I, I laugh when I tell people one of the first principles I learned of social entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship uh, in any industry uh, is everything takes longer and costs more than you think it will. Yes, everything takes twice as long as you think. Like all of my timelines are off. That's why I'm struggling with <laughs> constructing a realistic timeline. <laughs> Because yeah, there's so many hurdles along the way that you would have never even imagined. Like, <laughs> if somebody were to tell me all the stuff that would have happened to my business this year, I would have not believed them. And I think that's applicable to most businesses. Like, stuff just gets thrown at your face, and you're like, mm -hmm. watching them. I often say it was a blessing that I had no clue what I didn't know I didn't know when I started. Yeah. It's it's really true. I think if you spend too much time preparing, you could just prepare forever. And then half of it is not actually relevant <laughs> by the time you do it. <laughs> Progress instead of perfection. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, we always run over on these calls, but I think we're, we're sort of uh, reaching the edge of our extended conversation. So uh, there's lots more. I'm sure uh, I would like to know about Rover and Ken and our audience with, where can our audience find you? Yeah, um, roverandken.com. Um, we've just revamped our website a little bit. Otherwise, you should definitely follow us on Instagram because we try to update that daily, but you know, <laughs> doesn't always up. happen. I know. <laughs> so at Rover and Kin or roverandkin.com. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, you've uh, offered a special discount to uh, viewers for shopping on your e-commerce site. You want to tell our yeah. uh, tell our viewers <laughs> about that? Just punch in shop for good, and then you get twenty percent off everything. Perfect. We've posted that today as well on our social media. So if you're watching this, uh, take advantage of that, of this. So as we come to the end of our conversation today, if I say the words conscious collaboration, what does that look like for you? Mm, yeah, it's actually, um, it's interesting you ask because that's definitely something I've thought about through the course of the pandemic, like working with people whose values align with yours. And that is so important because um, in business partnerships, I think if you work with people who don't have the same values as you, it's really hard to be on the same page. It's hard to be on the same chapter. You might not even have the same book <laughs> and so things will go wrong and so when you trust the people you work with when you're working towards the same goal and together not just by yourself with others you know with the community that's how you succeed um we're just i'm just one our business is just one but when we join forces with our artisan partners when we swap notes with the fair trade community when we work together, it's a really powerful force. Um, but 
but yeah, choosing to consciously select the people you work with, um, with the same goals and the same values. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's how you, you know, accomplish your mission. That's how you achieve your goals. That's how you make an impact. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Wen, for joining us today. Uh, you brought up several topics that I'll be reaching out to you offline. Well, it'll be <laughs> online, but off Zoom uh, to discuss with you further for Hoonarts uh, to see how we might be able to share some information and, and maybe do some other collaboration uh, going forward. Uh, it's been fascinating talking to you and thank you so much for uh, your effort to build a better future for everyone. Well, thank you for having me. I really have enjoyed our conversation. I'm usually super awkward with stuff like this. And so I feel like you've made it very comfortable and I've really enjoyed this. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Uh, one of the things I've always uh, identified as a, as a business value for Hoonarts is uh, authenticity and community. So yeah. just talking to people from the heart and creating a space where they can communicate communicate from that same place makes all the difference. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks again. And we will sign off. Uh, the Facebook video will be up. Uh, should be, it should show up in, in the Facebook live on our, on our uh, Facebook page as soon as we sign off. And we will also have it on our YouTube channel and on our uh, blog so if you uh, you'll be able to access it in numerous places thanks again and thank you again Denise for uh, your contributions not only today but over the years so we'll see you next time in a couple of weeks we'll be having another Hoonarts live event and uh, fingers crossed I think we will be able to talk in very concrete terms about our upcoming uh, three stands tour uh, scheduled for the fall of 2022. I think we're about to go live with uh, that, that uh, the details of that tour and open the doors for people to start booking that tour. So, so we'll see you next time. <laughs> bye bye.